So, hello everybody, here I am with Ben Foreman. It's a great honor. Hi, Ben. Hi. Ben is a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. He is a brief therapist and is uh, very famous in uh, Finland, but also in the rest of the world. He wrote over than 20 books uh, about brief therapy, in particular about uh, kids therapy and kids skill. We will talk about that in a moment. And he was the he is the founder of the Helsinki Brief Therapy Institute, and he also studied in uh, in Italy with Boscolo and Chekin. That was Great, yeah, cool. The the Milan School of Mara Silvini Palazzoli. And he also had a um, TV program with over 200 uh, episodes here, yeah, right? Okay, so it's a very great honor to me to have you here, Ben. And my honor, my honor. You're too kind. So, are we ready? Yes. Okay, so the very first... Um, question before talking about kid skill it's that uh, that there is a very interesting thing about you you start with long-term therapy you start studying uh, psychoanalysis if i understood right yeah in in, in my country in finland mm -hmm. you know when i when I became a psychiatrist, that's many years ago. It's like 200 years ago or something. And I started to study psychiatry at that time. Everybody was uh, going to become a psychoanalyst. Yeah. It, it was at that time the dominant discourse, like they say. Yeah. So all my colleagues uh, wanted to become psychoanalysts. And I, I thought I would also need to become a psychiat psychoanalyst in order to take myself seriously as a psychiatrist. But at the same time, new trends started to come into our field, and one of those trends was family therapy. In fact, then you go to study brief therapy. And so the question is, we can't do brief therapy with kids. And what are the characteristics of brief therapy with kids? I think that the characteristics is the same. Uh, instead of saying brief therapy, we might even say that there's a different philosophy of solving human problems. It uh, maybe comes from Milton Erickson. It's maybe refined by the people at MRI Mental Research Institute, Paul Václavík and his team. They started to develop this kind of a new way of thinking that, um, may I say, the, is not interested in why people have problems, is more interested in what is maintaining problems, what is keeping people stuck in problems, what perhaps not so good attempted solutions they are using, and if we can change the way we approach problems and more recently, if we can change the way we talk about problems, we can maybe solve problems much more effectively than uh, we used to do when we were so interested in finding out what is causing the problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are for you a good way to help kids in, uh, in brief time, in few sessions? I think I can answer that because um, because when uh, we use the brief therapy model to work with kids, we actually speak very little about their problems. Mm -hmm. We don't analyze problems. We don't diagnose children. We we approach them differently, and I like to say we approach them with a skills mindset if that's possible to say like that, skills mindset. So when you look at the child who has a problem from the skills mindset point of view, you are not seeing a child with a problem. You are, you are seeing a child who needs to develop some skill. You're, you're more aware of what skill is missing for that child, 
what skill that child needs to learn in order not to behave like that. So your whole thinking is much in the realm of skills. When I talk with parents, I say, what skill do you think your child needs to learn? When I look at the child, I go like, what skill do you think you need to learn so you will be happy and it will be fun for you to be in school? And if I talk to this teacher, it will be the same question. So in a way, my job becomes to be a teacher. In a way, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching people how to think about children's problems. And I'm teaching a kind of a mindset that I like to call it skills mindset. Because when you shift from talking about problems and you start to talk about skills, it changes the way the mind operates. People become more optimistic. Why? Because, you know, you can learn. You can always learn skills. Children want to collaborate. They, they start to have ideas. If you then start to say, OK, so how can you learn that skill? So suddenly children are participating in the conversation. Parents have some idea. I can even ask daddy, how did you learn that skill? Or I can ask mommy, are you good at that skill? Can you teach your child to learn the same skill? So in a way, when we say brief therapy, it doesn't really capture the essence. It's maybe better not to speak about brief therapy, but another way of approaching children's problems that I think maybe we should call it skills mindset or something. Yeah, I like it. Um, you know, uh, listening to you, I remember... Um, a sentence that John Wickland said, uh, I read it on uh, Michael, Hoyt, uh, Michael Hoyt's book, and he said that one problem with us, we as, as therapists, is that we, um, we start to become not a mental health professional, but mental um, disease professionals, you know? And in a way, what you're saying is that we have to um, become again mental health professional to to focus our view or way to see clients on their skills on their health on what works yeah yeah i like that very much and and you know when you start to talk about skills when your mindset is in the in the realm of skills then it's kind of natural to talk about what skills have you already learned what are you good at? Yeah. Uh, you, you become like naturally solution focused. So that's why I don't teach solution focused thinking. I teach skills mindset. Yeah, it, Be it, yeah but sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it, it follows automatically because once you start to talk about skills, you can talk about skills that you have already learned. You can talk about skills that you need to learn. You can talk about how much have you already learned that skill. You can talk about how can you learn that, who can help you to learn that skill. And all these kind of natural questions start to flow. And the conversation is very pleasant. If you want to call it brief therapy, that's okay. If you want to call it solution-focused uh, work with children, that's also okay. I call it kid skills, but that's just for marketing purposes. Yeah, in fact, now please, uh, we just entered in the kid skills uh, mindset and in your, your method. But can you tell more about that? Can you tell more about um, a little bit of story, uh, if you want, and uh, more about the method, uh, more about what you just say, the kids' skills. Yes, it's um, many years ago, uh, 20 years ago, you know, time passes quickly. I was uh, asked to become a supervisor for a small team of uh, teachers, kindergarten teachers, you know, mm -hmm. children who are like five, six years old. All these kids had major problems. They had been removed from normal groups to the special group, children with special needs, aggression problems, anxiety problems, all kinds of problems. And then they asked me if I would help them develop a more solution-focused approach to working with these children and, of course, the parents too. And so when I became involved, I said, maybe we should develop something together that other 
kindergartens or schools or families could benefit from like a protocol. You know, when I say protocol, I mean step by step approach that can be described and given to other people. Try this, this may help you. And we started to collect, let's say, useful steps. I think we took ideas from narrative therapy, some ideas from, of course, many ideas from solution focused therapy, and from Milton Erickson and from our own experiences. And in the end, we ended up with 15 steps. So then that means it's not so easy to very quickly explain the method because it has 15 steps. Yeah. But um, then I would have to like speak a little bit about each step. But I can say that the main step, the most important step, is taking the child's problem and converting it into a skill that the child should learn. So if the child is, for example, aggressive and hitting other children, then the first step, almost, almost the first step is thinking. You have to stop and think. So what skill does this child need to learn? And you cannot say he has to stop, learn to stop hitting other people. It's not a skill to learn to stop doing the wrong thing. You have to take one step further and you have to, yes, yes, he has to learn to stop hitting other children. You are right. But what skill does he need to learn so he can stop doing that? And that is the big question. And then you have to think and maybe after a little while you say something like, oh, maybe the child needs to learn to calm himself down when he's becoming angry like that. You know, then the skill is calming yourself down when you become angry. And that's already a skill to learn. So this is the maybe the main step in kids' skills. And it's not always so easy. So in fact, I ended up doing an app like writing uh, uh, the text for an app. And now you can take the app from Google Play or from yeah. App Store, and you can find all kinds of children's problems in the app. And there will be some suggestions for what skill the child would need to learn if they have this problem or that problem. There are more steps because I said there are yeah. 15 steps. So then almost all the other step are different motivational strategies. You know, like how do you get the child to want to learn that skill? You need to do stuff like you need to talk with the child about the benefits of the skill. Maybe you need to plan a celebration, you know, like when you have learned the skill, would you like to celebrate in some way? Shall we buy a cake for you and have a big party for you because you have learned the skill? So you're kind of motivating the child. So it becomes exciting to learn the skill. And a very important step in kids' skills is the, the, the step where we ask the child, who can help you? Hmm. Which people can help you? How can your mother help you? How can your teacher help you? And this is special. How can your friends help you? Oh, yeah. You know, in traditional therapy, we never involve the friends. Or maybe we do these days, but in the olden times, we never did. In the psychoanalytic tradition, it was just the patient and you would do something with the patient. Maybe for years you work with this patient to try to change them. But now this thinking is totally different. It's like, I am not going to help you change. I'm going to help you think about who around you can help you to change. And you are going to tell them how you want them to help you. So it's a kind of a different mindset altogether. And it's not difficult. It's not complicated. Everybody can understand it. But it is so different from what we are used to that uh, it takes a while for people to get it. Yeah, well, I love that. I love that because I believe that and I see that if you focus on the, um, on the skills, on the person skills, kids skills and uh, adult skills and family skills, you can have a, a better work, uh, better in terms of uh, number of sessions, but better in, in, in the world sense, you know, because you help the the people, the, the patients, the client, 
to recognize uh, their skills and to recognize what they can do and what to do. You say that it's um, it's not a complicated, and I believe that. Um, but the next question is, what is complicated in the work with kids? When you do therapy with, with kids, with um, children and adolescents too, what is, in your opinion, the most complicated thing and how can you manage that? How can you um, work with that? Do you remember when uh, we started to learn family therapy? Then one of our heroes, at least many years ago, was Salvador Minucci. Mm -hmm. And Salvador Minucci was teaching that when you do family therapy, you always start with something he liked to call joining. That was his word, joining. In uh, some other therapy approaches, they call it rapport, like mm -hmm. building rapport, they say, or just connecting with the people. And I think this is true for kids' skills too, that, it, it, that if people forget the joining part, then actually nothing works. Mm -hmm. Kids' skills doesn't work. Brief therapy doesn't work. Nothing works. You have to learn to join the family and the child and so on. So I'm teaching often, often I say, you cannot do kids' skills uh, without step number zero. I had to call it step number zero because I forgot to put it into the system. So now we have step zero, additional step, preparatory step. And this preparatory step means you have to build a positive uh, relation with the child and the teacher and the family and so on. And this I have suggested that you can do in a very simple way. You simply start asking good things about the child, uh, talking about good things about the mother, maybe giving some compliments, even better making them give compliments to each other. So I designed even a game for this, you know. You take a bottle, and you know the game that teenagers play where you turn the bottle? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then yeah. it points to you yeah. or to him. And you turn the bottle and then it points to mother. Let's say now it points to mother. Mm -hmm. And then everybody has to say something good about mother. Oh, why they beautiful. love her, why she's so lovely, why she's a good mother. Father has to say something like that. The children have to say something like that. So it takes a little while to get them going, but once then, then, then you turn the bottle again, and now it's pointing to the teenage daughter. Everybody has to say something nice about the teenage daughter. So it's a kind of a game that we play to prepare for the session. And if you don't do something like this, and I don't mean you have to turn the bottle, it's just an example of what you can do. So, um, so you need to do that in order for people to feel happy, uh, to feel appreciated, to feel um, respected, uh, to feel that they are loved and liked by other people. And when they start to relax, then it's possible to work with them and to start to ask them, okay, so what skill do we need to learn in order to be even happier? Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you forget that part, so then uh, you might, uh, if you go too fast, so to say, if you go too fast. But this is a principle that we already learned many, many years ago from Salvador Minucci, from Milton Erickson. I'm sure we learned it from all the great names in our field if we pay attention yeah yeah we know that the relationship in general another way to, to call it it's the most important thing in every uh, we could say in every therapy but we could say almost in every job probably in, yes. in, in every interaction in every interaction with, with people mm -hmm. okay okay and if you have um how to say um, um an, an opposite, opposite, um, a positive, a positive kid, or an a positive uh, parent, uh, or a positive teacher. Um, how, how can you manage that? And I think you mean like oppositional. Oppositional, yeah. Opposition, like when they are like, I don't want to you yeah. know, talk with you. I don't you. want to be there. This is the bullshit. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, why did we have to come here? You know? Yeah, exactly. 
how can yes. you manage that? I think uh, this is important because sometimes people are coming to see us and they don't even want to come to yeah. see you. So this is part of joining too. So it's like, like I, I, one of my questions that I, I like to ask is that, have you been in this kind of meetings before? Mm. Or have you met a psychologist or a psychiatrist like me before? Have you been here at the school in a meeting before? Have, the, have you been talking to the social worker before? So I like to kind of analyze with them what experiences they've had before to find out if they have had negative experience. Mm. It kind of makes sense. So then I say, oh, okay, I understand that you, do, you didn't really like to come because you have had bad experiences before or you didn't like the last time you were there. So I hope this will be better for you this time. I'm kind of trying to convince them that maybe this is different. Maybe talking to me will be a little bit different than the previous time you talked with somebody else. I, sometimes I even say we are still learning this profession and we are not always capable of you know, doing good sessions, but I hope this one will be good for you. And you can teach us to make it better for you. So we are learning from you, kind of changing the ball game because so many people have experienced unpleasant experts. Experts yeah. can be quite unpleasant. And uh, some people who have been to school because there had been some problems with their child in the school have actually had like, I'm if I'm not exaggerating, traumatic experiences mm -hmm. when they have been talking to professionals. So our job is to kind of make them feel that this may be actually different from what you experienced before. And even that the feeling that this might be different, you can perhaps do something of, to prevent it. You can say, well, come in a warm, nice way. You can say something like we are learning, we are developing our ways of working. Maybe you can help us to improve our, our methods. And then, of course, I always start with what would be a good result for you. The solution-focused people have uh, developed an art. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an art form yeah. where you always go to the people and say, what would be a good result for you? Yeah. If they say, uh, we did, I didn't like, uh, I have been here before, it was bullshit. Why do I have to come here? And this is, this is idiotic. Then you say, okay, I, I understand. You have had uh, not so good experiences before. But suppose this was somehow, somehow this session that we have will be good for you. What would be a good outcome for you? What, what would be a good result for you? The, the more they feel that we are really genuinely interested yeah. in what would be good for you, I'm sure it takes a little while before they before they become convinced that you are truly on their side. But when they start to feel that you are truly on my side, I don't think every, anybody will be negative. People will be very willing to talk with you if they have the feeling that you are on their side, that their best interest is, is important to you, their negative previous experiences, you are interested to hear about that, and they feel that you genuinely want to make it a good experience for them. So, my long, it was a long answer to a good, uh, good question, but, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question of um, respect. Yeah. If, you, if we respect people, they will want to work with us. I like it. I like it because you really transmit that you really want to take care of them and you are really interested in them. So I have a last question, Ben. Um, let's imagine that you have to teach to um, who are listening this, this video or seeing this video um, a skill. Yeah. Imagine um, a competence, a skill that you think is very important for psychologists and psychotherapists and therapists in general to work with kids. I ask you, the first thing, what is this skill? And the second thing, imagine an, ex an exercise, to propose an exercise to the psychologists to do it in their uh, 
um, common life uh, outside their, their house or in their, in their home. And uh, what is the competence, the skill, and what is the exercise that you propose to develop, to improve, improve this, this skill? I have worked for so many years with Tapani Ahola. He's yeah. my business partner, and we have developed ideas together. These days we talk on the phone every week and to share ideas. And the last time we were talking, we, we had a chat, we had a talk about this, like, like what is the pivotal or the most important, the, the key mm -hmm. uh, to, to this kind of thinking? What would we want everybody to learn? And then uh, this competence that you are maybe also trying to come to, this competence, it doesn't really have a name, but uh, let's give it a name. Uh, because there is the word goal, we could make a uh, little play with words and start to speak about goaling. Goaling, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, there is no, there yeah. is no such word, but we make it up. Yeah. It's a neologism. We yeah, make yeah. a new. Let's see what and is. and then we can give meaning to it because it didn't exist before, so we can give our own meaning to it. And uh, this word goaling means. I define this word, and it means taking any problem and converting it into the corresponding goal. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like saying every time you complain about something, you are actually maybe wanting to tell me what you want instead. Oh. So when you say, I hate it when it's so dark. Oh, I love that. Uh, so then it means you want more light, right? Uh, if you say this uh, the food is, you know, is uh, unsalty, it, it doesn't taste anything. Oh, you mean you want to have more spices in the soup. So when you complain about something, you actually have, maybe you are not expressing it, but somewhere you have a wish, something you want different. And uh, if people learn, if everybody would be speaking, not about what they are unhappy with, but they would be telling each other what would make them happy. You know, even in a couple relationship, if people tell each other, this would make me happy. If you give me a kiss on the on the cheek in the morning, it would make me happy. Rather than complain, you never say you love me. Nobody's going to say, I love you, if you tell them you never say you love me. So, I mean, in relationships, in families, in schools, in workplaces, if we all became better at when we hear a problem, somebody's complaining about something, we kind of see behind that complaint. And we go like, oh, do you mean, you almost like, oh, do you mean that you would like to have more spices in your food? But if somebody says, uh, you know, the, the, the child is hitting, is disturbing in the classroom, you look at that person and say, oh, do you mean that you would like him to learn to sit still in the classroom? And then the person would say, yes. Of course. And then you will say, oh, so you would like him to learn to sit still in the classroom. You are changing the way you speak. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing, but the words are different. And now, like one uh, mother said, 12-year-old girl and mother was mm -hmm. talking to me. And I said, what skill you would like your daughter to learn to the mother? And the mother said, she lies to me about her homework. When I ask her, is, do you have examination this week? She says she doesn't have. And when I ask her, did you get any homework? She says she didn't get any homework. She lies to me. I don't like it. I don't accept that my child lies to me. So I looked at the mother and I said, do you mean that you would like your daughter to learn to speak honestly to you about homework and examinations, and to tell it like it is. And the mother says, yes, because it's the same thing. What can she say? I just changed the way I said the same thing. And then I looked at the girl and says, do you think it would be good if you learned to be honest to your mother about your homework? And the girl said, yes. 
so we can start to work because we have a com go common goal. So how to stop talking about problems and to start to see the goals, well, let's say the goals behind or embedded or inside. Uh, every complaint is deep down a wish. And the more we talk on the wish level about improving things, the more likely everybody is to participate and then we can avoid these awful blaming games, you know, blame storming when everybody's blaming yeah. everybody and <laughs> criticizing, so. blame storming. Yeah. So then uh, we can have much more pleasant conversations and, and our job as therapists becomes uh, much easier. Yeah, that's, that's very precious. I I, I love that. I love this this competence goaling you say, yeah, and uh, and the exercise exercise. It's it's very easy to do that in the common life, but not so easy to do that because you have to um, to change your mindset, to change the way you see the yeah. things. But it's very precious. Uh, Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. And you said about the exercise. I didn't answer the exercise, but it was kind of embedded because then you can actually make a list of different problems okay. and you can ask people, so what is the wish behind this problem and what is the wish behind this problem? Okay. And you can actually train your mind in figuring out what may be the wish behind. Of course, you always have to check and you have to say, am, am I right that this is what you want? I like it. Ben, thank you so much. This is a very good interview. I, 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 I had to take notes about what you say and hope to see you soon, maybe in Italy again, like last, uh, last year, okay? And Firenze, Firenze. In, oh, yeah, 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 in Firenze in, um, in September, right? You will be there? I think so. Oh, that's cool. So we'll see for sure in Firenze and Thank you again and see you soon. Bye. Bye.